was very valuable for our church. Very, very valuable. Extremely valuable. And it forces us to make everything we've been learning much more practical, I think. And Lois, go sit in the back. Thank you. And it puts us in a position too crowded. I don't know how you're going to pay attention with all those people in that little space. So go on. It puts us in a position to really think about what we need to do, how to respond to that. Um, and so we, we see the need to, to sow as much as we can, to sow more. Those that don't give out tracks can start. Those that do give out tracks can sow a little bit more as you're giving out that track and, and then look to reap. When we think about reaping, who do you know that should go through something like the Seekers Bible Study, someone you've been praying for, working on, that you think might be interested in going through the Seekers Bible Study? I have a neighbor that I think could fit that category, Seville. Um, but does anybody have anyone that you're thinking of in particular that, that you need to approach them or, or you think that this might be something they would be willing to do? Julie? And, and, and that part of his lesson about coming to church, hearing the messages, still not getting it. And we've been bringing people to church for years that may still not be getting it. And all they really need is someone to, to sit down with them and walk them through these things. Sabrina, who are you thinking of? Would you be willing to start a Bible study with me once a week? And um, I've got the booklet, and we can go through it together over coffee or whatever you like to drink. What are you thinking of, Monique? Uh, my okay. She has it. Okay. The one that was here yesterday? Okay. All right. And again, these are just ideas. And it, it just can't stay an idea. We have to get after it. Alex, who are you thinking of? Your brother. Mm hmm And that, that raises a, an important point. Someone that has trusted the Lord, they've prayed to be saved, you've carefully worked with them, they've received Christ, amen. The seeker's Bible study isn't going to hurt them. You're going to show them more of what they got, right? And so we can, we can use it as a discipleship tool to help them fully understand what they got. Um, and again, I agree with Brother Cloud. Let's not let that study be something we just pass out like water, like a tract. 
Okay, if you're going to give it to them, then that should be a commitment that you're going to work with them. Don't just say, hey, here's a study, and, and I, I did my duty. You know, plan a time and work with them through it. Paige? Quita. Okay. So that not, the hands are just going up. That's good. Now let's do it. Let's do it. Let's do it. We, I got to give Brother Cloud his time. He's going to get mad at me. So you come on up here. last day of our conference on evangelism and this will be my last message and this is the subject of fishing and sowing fishing and sowing and the last message was sowing and reaping but this is fishing and sowing aggressive evangelism is a fundamental of the faith church is not aggressive in evangelism can't be called truly really a bible believing church might hold the King James Bible, might still use the hymns, and might still have modest dress, but if it's not aggressive in evangelism, I really don't know how it could be called truly a Bible-believing church. Most of the large aggressive churches of bygone days from my lifetime are dead or dying. And I think of Highland Park Baptist Church in Chattanooga, Tennessee, which was the home of Tennessee Temple Bible College, which was the largest Baptist church in, I think, the world at, <clears throat> in the 70s. It was huge. The college was huge. And they very much had a great emphasis on world missions. They campaigned on world missions, campaigned on it. They gave half of their income, that huge church gave half of its income to world missions. Right down the not half of the mission's money, half of its money, all of its money. It was a lot of money. And they had these amazing, exciting missionary conferences every year in which uh, there would be 100 missionaries. It would be 80 to 100 missionaries. And uh, just, just great, great emphasis and hundreds of young people and uh, uh, moms and dads, married people, 
surrendered their lives to world missions and went all over North America to the ends of the world and uh, preached the gospel and planted churches. It was very fruitful. It was a campaign, and that church definitely campaigned on evangelism big time. It was called the Church of the Green Light, and they had this mock-up of a, a, a light signal, traffic signal, right there on the campus and right by the main auditorium of the church. And it was always on green, never changed. And that'd be nice in Chicago, tell you that much. <laughs> Some of these traffic lights are just ridiculous. But anyway, it was always on green. And it meant it was go, it was just constantly go. Let's go with evangelism, it was all about evangelism. And let's go and let's go and let's go and uh, they went door to door, and they preached on the streets, and they started a gospel uh, chapels. They started gospel chapels all over that part of the South, Alabama, Georgia, Tennessee. They had youth camps. They had rescue, operated their own rescue mission, anything they could think of. It was the Church of the Green Light. A major, major campaign, and sadly, a lot of it was of that effort was corrupted because of the wrong methodology. But that zeal was right. Amen. And that zeal is being given up. Right. Being given up among independent Baptists. Right. It's always been the thing we have prided ourselves in, so to speak. Many churches are still doctrinally sound, but they're dying because little evangelism. I talk to a man, pastors, I talk to pastors all the time. One of the purposes of this trip is to meet some new pastors. I've met some new pastors already uh, before I got here. Met some new pastors while I've been here and uh, talk to them, ask them questions, trying to find out what's happening, trying to find out better and better what's happening. And uh, it's a learning experience. But many churches, they have all that, but they're dying. King James, they use the hymnal, sound and doctrine, maybe still modest in apparel, but they're just dying. I don't want to go to a church like that, honestly. Let me be candid. I don't want to go to church like that. And my wife certainly wouldn't. She's, she's not any kind of one, two, three, but she's the greatest soul winner I've ever Amen. really known of. And that's simply loving people to Christ, giving them the gospel, loving them giving them the gospel, and, and uh, they get saved. She loves that. She lives for that. She absolutely lives for that. And no, Christ likened evangelism to fishing and sowing. Matthew 4, 18 through 19. Christ likened evangelism to fishing and sowing. And so, Matthew 4, 18 and 19. Matthew 4, 18 and 19, and Jesus, walking by the Sea of Galilee, what a beautiful place, saw two brethren, Simon called Peter, and Andrew, his brother, casting a net into the sea, for they were fishers. And he saith unto them, Follow me, and I will make you fishers of men. And so fishing, evangelism, he's talking about evangelism and liken it to fishing. Fishing, I love fishing. I've loved fishing ever since I was a little boy. Grew up in Florida, and my, my dad and my granddad, they took me fishing all the time. Uh, bass fishing, topwater plugs, mostly. And when it would get hot in the middle of the day in Florida, uh, they would start trolling and all kinds of experiences with that. And I wasn't so interested in fishing, but I was real interested in what mom had packed in that lunch bag. So I would eat, and granddad would say, son, you're not gonna catch any fish if you don't keep that hook in the water. It's fundamental for evangelism. And then in, math, in Luke 8, 5 and 11, Luke 8, 5 and 11, a sower went forth to sow. Here's evangelism again. A sower, now we're sowing seed, farming. 
A sower went forth to sow his seed, and as he sowed, some fell by the wayside. It was trodden down, and we go on through that parable. But here, preaching the gospel, evangelism is likened to sowing seed. These are very interesting metaphors. They are endlessly informative. But one thing it tells us, that the point I want to emphasize here, is that we must sow a great amount of seed, and we must have many lines in the water. If we want to catch, if you want to catch fish, like my granddaddy said, you got to keep your line in the water. Now, with fishing, there's all kinds of regulations in America. I fished in Washington, fished in Florida, fished in other places, fished in British Columbia, but. Um, they have a lot of restrictions. You can only use so many lines and certain kind of hooks and certain kind of this and that. But God has no restrictions. You can have as many lines out as you want, many hooks on it as you want, just fish, 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 fish. And there's a simple principle for fishing that the more you fish, the more fish you'll catch. It's very simple. You ask any fisherman, the more fish, the more fishing you do, then the more potential that you'll have to catch some fish. If you just go out there on that pier over there on the lake right across there, and you just go out there maybe 10 minutes uh, once a week or once a month, you won't catch many fish. Probably won't catch one. Uh, you got to put your time in with fishing. You got to put your effort in. And then it pays some dividends for you. Fishing. So Christ likened um, evangelism to fishing. And then he likened it to sowing. And again, with sowing, with the farmer in this present world, he's limited as to how much land he owns. And since the federal government owns most of the land in America anymore, that's a big limitation. No farmer has but just so much land. And so that's all he can do. He can't go over there and sow his neighbor's fields. But we don't have any restriction in the gospel work. The, the field is the world. Right. I can sow and sow. No church can own my territory, that's the Roman Catholic concept. No Baptist church can say, you can't come here and fish in our territory. Amen. Now, we need to be wise, and we need to be, you know, honorable and wise. But no, the, the field's the world. So there's no restrictions from God's side on these things. The only restriction is on our side, how much we want to do. The difference between fruitful and less fruitful, and so here's the first point. We must always analyze, adapt, and modify. Must always analyze, adapt, and modify. Fishing, sowing. Oh, farming has gotten so much improved since I was a little boy. So much improved. Scientific methodologies. And, uh, and it was said decades ago that there won't be enough food for the world and, and we're going to starve to death. We can't have any more people. We need to restrict the population growth, and, but we have plenty of food. And much of that comes back to modern technology that God has given. Uh, but modifying, analyzing, adapting, the difference between being fruitful and less fruitful in soul winning is often determined by relatively small things. Now, I know this from the fishing field. When I was growing up in Florida, as I mentioned, and I'd go fishing with my dad and my granddad, and we fished for largemouth bass, mostly. And we also trolled, and all of that is, uh, you have to learn how to do it. You have to learn better and better. And I especially learned this in the, when I lived in the Pacific Northwest on, in Washington State on Whidbey Island. And uh, there, the salmon run up the rivers in the fall. But on the way to the rivers, they run along the shores of those islands. And you can catch them off the shore if you know what you're doing. And so I decided I was going to fish for salmon one of the first years I was there. And I got all the equipment. You've got to get the equipment. Got to get the right hat. Everything, you've got to have it. And I went out there with all the right equipment, and I about threw my arm off. It caught absolutely nothing. I knew I was in the right place because other people around me were catching fish. 
And that's a terrible feeling. When you fish out there all day and you watch them pull in those salmons and you catch nothing. So I decided to quit. No, I didn't. I decided to try to figure out what I was doing wrong. Now, I could have said, maybe there's fish out there, but I don't believe it. So I'm going to stop fishing. But definitely there was fish out there. So I went to my, my pastor, and my pastor at the time was an excellent, he was a great fisherman. And he was a great salmon fisherman. I said, Pastor, this is happening to me. And he said, well, what are you doing? And I had my buzz bomb. A buzz bomb is a special kind of salmon lure that runs up and down your line, and it flashes in the water, and it attracts those salmon. And uh, he said, what are you doing? I said, I'm throwing my buzz bomb out there, and I'm bringing it in. He said, wait. It's, it's too aggressive, too fast. You gotta, he showed me how to do it. I went back out there. It worked. I started catching fish. I started catching fish. Then I taught my boys how to catch fish like that. We caught 120 pounds of salmon that year on the, off the shores of Whidbey Island. And uh, fine-tuning, always fine-tuning. I fished for kokanee on, in, in, Lake, in Baker Lake in those days. We'd go up to Mount Baker, some of the most beautiful scenery in the world, and fish in that lake that was uh, mirrored in that lake with these snow covered mountain peaks and fish for landlocked salmon which is called kokanee and there we had to fish with maggots and we had to learn how to chum and we had to learn totally different techniques and you had to learn how to do it you had to this was fishing in a boat we had to find out where in the lake you need to go kokanee weren't just everywhere in the lake had to go to the right place had to fish at the right depth had to had to learn a whole bunch of things but that's what we need to do People have passion for that in every, every area of life. I want to learn. I want to learn it better, something we're interested in. But in the church, in the churches, just dull usually. Dull, dull, dull. Why do you, why do you sing two stanzas and, miss, and skip the third one and sing the fourth one? I don't know. We've always done that. You ever thought about it? I never thought about it. Why not? Why not think about it? Why not think about everything? What am I doing? Why am I doing it? How can I do it better? Really, we need to do this. We're talking about evangelism. Two Bible-believing churches can operate in the same city, and one will be more fruitful than the other, simply because of the difference in zeal and effectual planning and details of how things are operated. Having program is not enough. It must be conducted wisely, and it must be reevaluated regularly. Now think of a pastor who started a church in a northern city, one of our largest cities, and he was successful, and God blessed him. And they started a church in a big city, very hard thing, and they even bought a building and they couldn't afford any kind of property, hardly, in that huge city. And so they found this old warehouse, and they, it was just a shell. And they had enough money to, get in, to, to, to buy the warehouse, but not to fix it up at all. So they couldn't meet in it. And so they met in a tent for a year. And they saved their money, and they got in that building, and they renovated that building, and they had a church building, and he trained a pastor and left that church in good hands with the pastor, and that church is going on. A lot of success. That's big stuff. And uh, a good congregation of people, big stuff. He went down to Florida in his older years, and he moved over to the Gulf Coast, and he told me recently that he and his wife knocked on every door in that area. He told me we knocked on every door in that area, and nobody's interested. And what he did in, in that big city doesn't work down there. And he's basically just saying, well, it doesn't work down here. And I sat there thinking, why don't you try something else? He is preaching in a little bitty church. I think there's more we can do usually. 
usually. I do. I think there's more we can do. We need to think. We need to pray. We, we need to analyze. We need to be willing to modify. We have to aim to reach. We're talking about sowing and farming. Uh, yeah, sowing and fishing. As much seed, the more seed you sow, the more crop you'll get. That's the more lines you have in the water, the more fishing you do, the more potential there is to catch fish. And the least you do, the least potential. So we can always analyze, why are people not getting saved? Well, how much seed am I sowing? How aggressively were we sowing in this particular town and then as far beyond as possible? Aiming to reach every type of person in the community. Mark 16, 15, Jesus commanded this. He said unto them, Go ye into all the world and preach the gospel, Mark 16, 15, and preach the gospel to every creature. Now that's a big job. And so it's God's command, it's Christ's command that we preach the gospel to every creature in our area and far beyond, as far beyond as possible. Now that's a big, big, big job. Amen. There's creatures coming and going. New ones being born all the time. Souls. So we, this requires a plan. There's no way this can be done without a plan. God gave us a mind. And uh, the first purpose for our minds is to figure out how to serve God. We can do things. We figure out all kinds of things. Send a man to the moon. That was big thinking. We can figure these things out. And uh, with God's help, so the church should plan a way, according to that command, plan a way to reach every person and every type of person in the community. Youth, parents, seniors, druggies, gangsters, drunks, businessmen, soccer moms, whoever's out there. So that requires planning, and planning requires constant reevaluation. Prayer for wisdom and good count, getting good counsel. House-to-house -house visitation, of course, is a major way to do this work. It's the only way, really, we can systematically go through a community. It's the only way that we can systematically. It encourages participation by every... We need to encourage participation by every member. Every member of the church needs to be involved in this business. It's God's command. It's God's will. It's very, very interesting. And it makes your life more fruitful and your Christian life more effectual in every way. It has great, great implications. Church is like a farming family. Every member is expected in a farming family. Every member is expected and required to participate in the work of farming. Even the little kids have their part. The mom has her part. The boys have their parts. The girls have their parts. The dad has his part. We're farming. One plan that I read about is called Visitation Night Outreach Stations. Now these are just ideas. They're not any kind of laws. But the idea that this man had, I don't even know if he's still alive, or even who he was. His name was Billy Britt. And I, and I got this a long time ago, but his idea was, I want, I want all my members to, to, be, to be involved in this visitation program. And so I'm going to do what I can. I'm going to do what I can to try to get all of them involved. And uh, he had outreach stations, he called them. So the, uh, all the members came, and then they actually did different things. Now, you can take this or leave this. This is just some, an idea that that's what we need to be doing is having some ideas. And some idea might, might uh, pump up another idea, you know, jumpstart another idea. Yeah. And so he had suggested outreach stations as follows. He wanted all the people to come and participate he had the door-to-door -door canvassing station. And so that's the people that go door-to-door, -door, cold knocking, door-to-door. -door. He had, the, secondly, the prospect visit station. Of course, basically, this is what every house-to-house uh, -house program does. You know, you have cards of 
prospects and, and some go there, targeted. They go to a certain address. Some go out and they're assigned a, a bunch of doors to knock on. And then he had the absentee visit station. And so some people would, uh, the secretaries would compile a list of members who had been absent for two or three consecutive Sundays and people would visit them on that night. And he had the email and telephone station. I think I added the email. This was a long time ago. He had the telephone station, if you remember what a telephone is. And then he had the prayer station. And some people, he, he encouraged those that didn't want to go out, they absolutely didn't want to knock on doors. Well, then you don't do anything. No, why not pray? So they had a prayer station. I thought that was very interesting a long time ago when I first read about it. But the, the whole principle is let's do everything we can to get every member involved and get the whole church geared up to do, do the work God has told us to do. Amen. And so we need to be evaluating. Every program, so-called, that we have, is there anything at all we could do to make it more fruitful? Are we going out at the right time? One church I recently um, was talking to one of the members, and he said, we don't go out on Thursday night anymore. We go out on Saturday. He said, since COVID, people here don't want a stranger knocking at the door at night. Might catch COVID or something. Hyper fear. People still wear masks. COVID was a changing of the time. So we just keep looking. Well, let's just keep going on Thursday night. Nobody opens the door anymore, but let's just keep going and do that. No, let's figure out. Maybe there's a better one. Time to go. Thinking. We're just so tradition bound, more tradition bound than the Episcopalians. No thinking. It's what we've always done. We don't do that in other areas of life. Americans are known as people that tinker and do things, but not with this. Do we have the right approach? Are we saying the right things? Are we leaving the right material? Are we doing everything possible to get every member involved? Do we have the best tracks? Are we doing anything to reach foreigners? Are there other places we could go? Refreshments after the service. I'm just throwing out some things, ideas and things. Refreshments after the service. Now we've found this very effective in our place Many years ago we started this. I think it was my wife's idea. She has lots of ideas. And uh, let's serve refreshments after the service and that way the visitors will stay and we can talk to them about Christ. It's been tremendous. Yeah. We always have many visitors staying behind, drinking our tea in the winter and drinking our Kool-Aid in the summer and uh, our cookies and talking to people about the gospel. It's a beautiful thing. And we have, we teach our people how to deal with the visitors, constantly teaching them, trying to teach them better, trying to fine tune these things. Amen. One man is in charge, and one man in our church is in charge of making sure all visitors are dealt with and followed up. Everything's got to be supervised. If you just let things kind of happen, it's, it doesn't work. Everything's got to be supervised. And so he is in charge of finding out what visitors are there and have they been there before and are they being dealt with and, and uh, which ones are becoming interested enough to be assigned a seeker's Bible study. And he's just overseeing it. And he's coordinating the other young men uh, in that regard. Gospel meal. And uh, this used to be effective in military bases, I remember that in Oak Harbor, Washington, at Bible Baptist Church, Pastor Pris had this. Every week they had a meal. And the young men, especially the young Navy men, would come and they would stay behind because they could eat a good home-cooked meal. The women of the church took turns making it. Lots of men got saved that way and then discipled. It was very effective. Visitor pies. Pastor Doug Hammett. Uh, formerly of Lehigh Valley, he 
said, we deliver a pie. I don't know if they still do this. But he said, we deliver a pie to first-time visitors the week following their visit to the church. Now, that'll impress somebody. A pie. Not a track. A pie. And there's nobody, hardly, that doesn't like a pie. Amen. I like peach pie. And I could go on and on and on about how I like pies. Well, everybody's like that. That'll get your attention. Whoa, a church that gives out pies. That's what we've got to do. First-time visitors. Another twist on that is to make pies and deliver them to new movians. New movians, which is a, a, big, a good mission field. People relocate, but it's a good project for teenage girls. They can go to the home of a godly lady church member and make pies and pray together uh, for the Lord's blessing on those pies and make them ready for that visitation to go out to those new move-ins and say we're from Cornerstone Baptist Church and we have a gift for you, a pie. <laughs> That'll get their attention. That is unusual. Monthly gospel meeting. As I've said before, we have this and it's been very, very effectual for us to focus our entire church's uh, gospel work into that meeting. It, okay, I'm talking to my relative, I'm talking to this person at, at, on the job, and, but that, I know that next Saturday is going to be the, the special focus on the gospel. I'm really going to try to get them there. And we're constantly trying to improve that. We have, everything is geared to the loss that day. The hymns, are chosen for that purpose. Uh, our song leaders teach those lost people a new song. They like that, the visitors. And they, we put on plays. The preaching is targeted for the gospel. We show videos, gospel videos. We have, my wife put together a video about hell. And there's people been saved through her video on hell. It's a shocking video. But that's what people need to know. There's a hell out there. We show videos. We have, we have testimonies. Our people come up uh, and give testimonies. We have men assigned to a man a table with tracks and other materials right outside the door as people leave. We have little gospel videos that people can put on their phones. We train the people to deal with the visitors. We have our refreshment time as we always do, and we have people all over the church dealing with people. So, during our workers' meeting the next week, our young men, there are eight young men, I believe right now, that we're working together, and uh, we, we analyze that gospel meeting, last, the last gospel meeting, see if there's something we can improve and, our, and these young men are learning to do that. We analyze everything. The preaching. And as I was telling Pastor Lewis, we, we, uh, God is continuing to call young men. Call them in answer to the prayer of our church every week. It continues. And, more, and young men are continuing to be called from the families in the church, but also from the rehab ministries, those that are being saved. And so I have to continually, we have to continually find a way to train preachers at a basic level because we want the, them to learn to preach. So I put together a short, pretty short preaching uh, course. And one of the, and it goes through some of the major things. It's a good start to have a good, uh, some fundamental ideas about how to preach. And, uh, but, but I think also the power of it is it has this checklist and and, and our preachers critique one another. Every time on Wednesday, Wednesday is devoted to the young preachers, basically to, to train them. And so they have a half hour message. And then all the other preachers critique them. You can't be thin skinned. And we're taught, we teach them, this is to help you. It's not to hurt you. And you have to deal with all that personal stuff. But they, they, they improve that way. And the other preachers improve by critiquing 
that they're brethren. And so we've got these young people, some of them teenagers, as you have. They're learning to preach, and every opportunity that they get, they're critiqued. And so we do that with our main preachers from the main service, gospel service, and critique the testimonies and critique the videos. Could everybody see the video? Could everybody hear the video? Was the sound system right? Uh, sound systems almost never quite right, and so we're always working on that, working on that. Don't just accept that. Keep working on that. The same toward perfection in these things. In that country, it's, man, they accept the lowest, kind of lowest thing, 30% passing for the public school. 30%. You can be go through high school and get your diploma, 50% passing for pharmacy degree. Think about that. You go to a pharmacist. Well, which 50% did he get? <laughs> they don't know anything about how medicines work together and all that. Nothing. It's a low denominator. Okay, but we're saved now. We belong to Christ. We're part of the kingdom of Christ. We're an outpost of the kingdom of Christ. And we're, we're going to up our game in every way. That's what we teach them. And they're coming along very well. We analyze everything. We analyze the songs. We analyze the specials. We just go back and analyze, trying, okay, next month, it's going to be better. From our side, street evangelism, gospel stands, using tracks. We have a whole chapter on using tracks and evangelism in this course. Uh, special occasions and events. special event. Pastors talked about that this week. Let's, let's, uh, let's find out what events are being held. Let's start targeting something toward them. Ministering to foreigners. Big mission field in America now. Huge, massive. Well, immigrants, students, whether permanent or, or just temporary, they're usually lonely. Uh, they find it difficult to make friends sometimes, many times. Churches can reach out to these people. Basically, we just need someone to be hospitable to these people. And someone has a good knowledge of the gospel, better and better. Someone with wisdom in dealing with people, people are people. And uh, target them. Internet and social media. It's, mass, it's the most effectual communication media that's ever existed. Oh, I've seen, I've seen the power of it from the beginning. I was, I think, definitely one of the first independent Baptists to go online and have a website. Early 1990s, I saw the potential. I've always tried to be on the cutting edge of these things. Yeah, it's used for evil big time. But it can also be used big time as a great tool for preaching and teaching. The church can use websites and Facebook. And I hate Facebook. But Facebook can be used uh, for the Lord and especially by churches. Of course, people don't go to the yellow pages anymore to look for church. They go to Facebook and other social media. What about TikTok? I've been talking to the young men about that. The uh, Nepali young people are crazy about TikTok, so are Americans. It's taken over the world, TikTok. And uh, it's just a bunch of little short video clips, basically. And, and, and they feed it to you one after the other, so you get addicted and you spend hours there. And most of it's filthy. I don't know what percent, but a lot. But they also have documentaries and how to do stuff and all. That's not why people go there, usually. But... What about the gospel? See, there's a danger here. We don't want our young people going to TikTok. So, you know, can we use these things? Is it possible? I don't know yet. I'm not sure. From our side, we've been talking about this with the young men because they know what the young people are doing. Where are they? They're on TikTok. What can we do? Can we reach them? They're not on the website. The young people are not on websites. They're on TikTok. 
And they're not on Facebook, not the kids. They're on TikTok, Instagram, and other things. Can we use that? We need to look at it. We need to think about it. Gospel broadcast. And, and, and anything that is done like that, even a website or a Facebook page, we need to keep it updated and put a lot of things on there. That's what brings traffic. Google, uh, if, you have a, if you have a lot of things, if you're, if you're constantly adding things, you're higher in the ratings. That's why Way of Life is way up in the ratings. You look, search Billy Graham, you're gonna, Way of Life's gonna come up there. Until Google decides it won't come up there. <laughs> but that's how it climbs up naturally in the ratings. And, uh, but we need to put preaching out there, put teaching out there, put testimonies out there. Testimonies of God's people and their own testimonies, those are powerful. And so you have little video clips, you sit down with your member and you get them to give the summary of his testimony. And you put it out there and you keep putting them out there. And uh, apologetics and gospel videos, all kinds of stuff. But, but it has to be, it has to look nice, it has to be attractive. And, uh, and, and, and the material it needs to be added, it needs to be fresh. Somebody shouldn't go there today and then go there in two months and it's the same thing. Obviously, that's not very attractive. Gospel broadcast, and in some places, it's still possible to run gospel broadcast on radio and television. We ran gospel broadcast for many years on multiple stations in Nepal. We reached a large part of Nepal in those days. These were commercial AM, AM stations. And we advertised everything we knew, we do, whether it's a track or whatever, we need to try to advertise a way that the people can get in contact with us, but not just a phone number, something that might draw their attention uh, to uh, contacting us. Anyway, we did that. And in those days, we, we had a, a correspondence course, seven lessons, and hundreds of people took that course. And honestly, I don't know all that happened with that. But we were so in big time through that means. Gospel ads. And uh, in some places still it's possible to put ads on in newspapers and radio and wherever. It's a good way to advertise gospel correspondence courses, but gospel Bible studies. We have a Bible study. We will go meet you. We will meet you wherever you, you want us to meet. You want to meet us and whatever. Metropolitan Tabernacle in London for years paid to play small gospel billboards in the London Underground stations. And any place you would go in London, I've been all over that underground, and uh, you'd see those gospel. They were shut down some years ago. But I'm just saying there's all kinds of things if we just think and plan and talk to other people and try to figure these things out and not be content with what we're doing. I mean, we can't do everything. There's only so much time, and we're very busy people. If Very busy people. We have many responsibilities. There's limitations, of course. But still, always thinking about these things. Home Bible studies, as we've talked about, seekers. Religious surveys. Those used to be very effective in some areas. Afternoon Sunday schools, correspondence courses, jail ministries, public schools, colleges and universities, nursing homes, new move-ins, a bus ministry. Oh, and planting new churches. One of the, one of the best ways to keep a church excited is to plant new churches. Amen. When possible, as God leads, to plant new churches. Amen. And, and it's hard. We don't want to give people away. Don't want to give people away. Nobody. Right. But, but the same principle applies to that as to other things. Given it shall be given unto you. Amen. And God wants to see the multiplication. So these are just some ideas. 
This is not the be all end all. We do have a book called Ideas for Evangelism um, that my wife and I collaborated on. But the point is, the more seed you sow, the more crop you'll get. That is not rocket science. It's just so simple, isn't it? But it's beautiful. What can I do to have more fruit? Sow more seed. Just sow more seed. And then if you're sowing all the seed possible, then okay, it's good. And then fishing. That's what Chris Starr says. He said, the last time I was with him, he said, we need to keep as many lines in the water as possible. Right. Keep those lines. Find out new ways to get some lines in the water. And then there's a possibility of catching more fish. It's not rocket science, but it's basic principles that Jesus himself taught us. And there are basically probably an infinite number of lessons from those two metaphors, just those two metaphors. But this one we're pulling out is that the more you do of these things, the more potential there is for fruit. And so we'll end there today, sowing and fishing. Thank you. For